Uh, good morning, everybody. Lovely to be here. My thanks, first of all, to Trish for allowing me to take her hour, steal that away from you, to Tim for organizing this at the university here, which is my first visit here, and to Adrian from uh, uh, Auckland Transport, who's one of the sponsors of my visit here to Auckland. Um, I've been here a few times before, but never actually in the university, and my background is as a walker. Um, uh, professionally, that is. I've been involved in this organization called Walk 21 uh, since the first year of this century when the first international walking conference was held in London. And the organization grew from that to be a supportive organization for advocates and professionals uh, around the world to support them in the de delivery of best practice for walking. Um, and I'm also now an independent consultant and, and speaker and so forth. Um, and in terms of the cycling, I'm not professionally qualified in any sense, but I'm a lifetime cyclist. So inevitably that ties in with my interest in walking. So it'll be, I hope, a, a mixture of those two today. And you can see what I really want to deal with, and that's this con contentious issue of getting access to local centres, however you define them. Um, it might be medical centres, it might be educational campuses, but mostly people think of that in terms of shopping strips and shopping centres. Um, and the question is, why should we try to uh, encourage more people to use their feet and their bicycles in order to access those centres and by definition, therefore, not use other modes of transport that might be uh, less desirable? So what I want to speak about is the economic importance of slow travel within centres, the misperceptions that exist around that, especially amongst many decision makers, to talk about what is a great walking environment, so at least we know what we're trying to plan for. And then to look at how you get to that center, because that's critically important as well. It's about access to the center rather than what you're doing when you're within the center uh, and what we need to provide there. And the so-called parking problem, which we'll examine critically, um, the need for walking and biking networks. And then last of all, we'll talk about the what we call the slow city dividend, which is the benefit that comes from focusing on walking and cycling into local centers. Okay, so that's the overall picture of what I want to do. The background to this is work that I've been doing over the last six or seven years. Uh, the image on the left is of a book published by Elsevier in 2020 called Slow Cities, Conquering Our Speed Addiction for Health and Sustainability. And that really has been driving my research and that of Paul Tranter, the co-author there, for the last six or seven years. And now we're moving on because that book focused on bringing out health in its broadest sense, economic health, physical health, mental health, environmental health from slow travel. And now we're focusing very much more down specifically on environmental health and the climate crisis. And so we're calling that, it's still in process, this book, Put Off the Gas, How Big Speed is Accelerating the Climate Crisis and What We Should Do About It. Okay, and that's with not only with Paul Tranter again, but with Matt Burke from um, Australia and Carlos Pardo from. Uh, um, the New Mobility Alliance in Washington, D.C. Okay, so look out for that. That should be coming out in the next year or so. So let's start by ha having a quick definition. I'm going to be rushing through this stuff quite quickly, so I hope you can go back and access it afterwards for detail that you might miss. But I'm going to try and leave 15 minutes or so at the end for, for, for questions. So if you can hold on for then, that'd, that'd be good. So what do we mean by the slow city? Well, it's a way of thinking about the city. If you think the prime purpose of your life in the city is this, how far can I go? Or how fast can I go? You're talking about a concept called mobility. And that mobility will then express itself in the urban cityscape as this. That is mobility. And of course, it's mobility only for some, because by definition, it's only for those who can drive and those who can afford to operate a motor vehicle. All others are excluded. But that's what you'll get if your base question is, how far can I go? If you turn that around and say, actually, I'm going far to get something, maybe the other question is this one, which is, how much stuff can I get to? And that stuff might be education, it might be medical, it might be a cabbage, it might be a job, whatever. But how do you access, how much of that can you get to in the city? Now you're talking about something entirely different. This is accessibility, not mobility. It's not about how far you travel. It's about access to the things that you need 
in the city to conduct your everyday life. And the urbanscape that will come from that will look something like this. Small, uh, focused on uh, slow modes, in other words, walking, cycling, micro mobilities, and access to public transport, uh, possibly relatively high density, but certainly easy access to all of those things that you, you need on a daily basis. So that's our goal, to talk about the slow city and the kind of benefits that might come from that. But we'll also, first of all, have to talk about the, the difficulties of delivering it. So let's ask the fundamental question, why are active modes vital for lo local centers? Well, think about what's happening in those lo local centers. For thousands of years, we've lived in cities to exchange things, ideas, goods, concepts, cultures, education, whatever it might be. And for that, you need face-to-face -face exchange. That's why we live in cities. And that's why cities exist. And that exchange takes up space. You need somewhere, you know, if I'm talking to Adrian, I might be quite close to him but we still need that little bit of space. And if he needs to go somewhere else to meet somebody else, he needs a little bit of space if he's going by walking. So our exchange space that we need is really quite limited. But also in the city, we need movement space. In other words, to get to the other activities. And provided we are all moving on slowly on feet or on bicycles, that movement space is really very limited as well. So the exchange space and the movement space can coexist. That's not a problem. The problem arises when somebody starts operating a vehicle which is going to be traveling at high speed and which gives danger to other people because now they need more space. Because obviously if you're driving at 30 kilometers an hour or 40 or 50, vehicles have to be farther apart, which means you need more space for the movement. They have to be parked at the end and the start of the journey, which means more space as well. So once you start allowing those modes to dominate your movement space, given that there's only a fine amount, finite amount of space in the city, then you have to give up exchange space in order to allow for more movement space. Does that make sense? So the more people start moving long distance or at higher speeds, the less exchange space you have and the less exchange possibilities you have. And so at the end, sorry, I've gone back here. At the end of that, what we're arguing here is that exchange space gets taken away by the movement space. And Ivan Illich, the uh, Hungarian philosopher from the US in the 70s, put it like this, beyond the speed of a bicycle, faster movement reduces exchanges, intimidates people, and spreads facilities beyond walking distance. Now, that's a fundamental issue. If we want our cities to operate in the way they always have operated, then we need to restrict the amount of movement space and keep alive the amount of exchange space. So that's really what this discussion is about. So let's turn to the specific issue of spending and access to town centers and what that does by different modes. And what I'm gonna do is show you some well-known examples. Um, and then I'm going to stop because there are zillions of examples and I'm not gonna go through all of them. It will just be very, very boring, but I'm just gonna show you some classic ones to illustrate the direction in which they've gone. This is a very famous one from London, probably 20 years ago or more, in which the amount of spend per person was attributed to the mode of transport that they used to access the various villages and cities within the metropolis of London. Those who came by walking spent £91 per week on average. Those who came by car spent on average £64 per week. So here's a fundamental nugget right at the start. Walkers spend more than people arriving by car. How can that be? They can't carry much, whereas people in cars can. The difference is the frequency of attendance at the local center. So car drivers buy more on each trip, but they only go to the city center a few times a week. Whereas walkers spend more in total, <clears throat> excuse me, because they visit so many times during the week. Does that make sense? They buy less on each visit, but they go more frequently. And there's a double bonus, bonus there because this is what we call the turbocharger effect. If people go to the city a lot, they are in the space. They are people in the space. And what's the world's favorite activity when you're in town? Watching other people. So the more other people are there, the more you want to be there. So people walking 
may not buy as much every time they go there, but they go there a lot. Their end result is their spend is higher than car users and they populate the space with attractive things that other people want to go and see. That's a classic from London a long time ago. Bring it up to date a little bit. This was a study in a street in Melbourne looking at bike parking spaces and the opportunities in, a, in that particular street. Um, Alison Lee found that the retail spend per hour generated by one parking space was $27 if you parked a car there for an hour, but $97 if you parked six bikes in the same space. Make sense? Take the car away, park six bikes, six cyclists, six people spending instead of one. And her argument at the end was replacing car parking with bike parking makes economic sense. Another one, a very quick one from a couple of years ago. Toronto, summer 21, converted some on-street parking spaces for local businesses to patios and parklets and so on. That generated nearly 50 times as much in revenue as would have come from parking a car in that space. Another one from Melbourne, Fairfield Village. The estimated monthly spend was significantly higher for walkers, $400, than drivers, $230 from a survey done by Vic Walks. Now, I could go on, <clears throat> I'm not going to. These studies have almost come to an end because nobody bothers to do them anymore because the results are always the same. And this is a really important point because we battle all the time with retailers who say, oh, well, that's Melbourne, oh, that's London, that's not gonna work here. But every time you do those data studies, you come up with the same result. Walkers spend more than car drivers, cyclists spend more than car drivers, every single time. I've not, in 20 years of searching, found any evidence to the contrary. It's, it's an absolute conclusion. So here's a problem, though, that we have, and this is the misperception that's out there about this importance that I'm stressing. This is a survey in Melbourne suburbs in 2019. And to understand the diagram, you need to understand the, the different colors here. The green color is the actual mode of customer travel. The gray color is the trader's estimates of customer travel, okay? So here, look, the traders thought 61% of their customers came by car, only 39% did. The traders thought that only 14% of their customers walked, actually 31% did. So there's a fundamental misunderstanding by traders about their own customers. They say they know their customers well. Well, clearly they don't. They don't know anything about their modal use and how much they spend. And it's happened in New Zealand here. One survey asked in several cities, in major shopping centers and shopping strips, what people wanted. They asked the retailers, what did they want to make their street better? Look what they said. More on-street parking, more off-street parking and pedestrian crossings. And they asked the shoppers what they wanted, and they said landscaping, frequent bus services, and pedestrian crossing. No mention of parking. Not an issue. But the retailers would like you to believe that parking is top of mind for everybody who goes shopping to any shopping centre. And it's a myth. It's a misunderstanding. It's a perception. Or it's a, it's a fib. It is just not true. So the importance of Walker's expenditure, therefore, is under, un, misunderstood as well. This is a survey in Brisbane of restaurateurs. Did they know how people arrived at their restaurant tables? No, they didn't. They overestimated car users spend by three times. They underestimated public transport users share by 100%. And they underestimated Walker's share by 100%. And so the findings imply that restaurateurs would be better off advocating for improved public transport rather than for more parking. So these results are really solid and they appear time after time after time. And as the authors of that study commented, disparity may lead traders to push for transport planning decisions which are not in their best interest. Now, how can you solve this problem if you don't have data? I want to just show you very quickly this example because I think this is really splendid. This is Ackland Street in St Kilda in Melbourne. Um, this is their main shopping street. It's very nice, 
uh, plenty of footpath dining, palm trees, sunny, open, you know, all the rest of it, very good, but there's not enough space. And the local government was really concerned that the retail offer here was being damaged by the crowding. So how do you resolve the crowding? Well, you can't move the tables and so on from private property. You can't expand the footpath because there's car parking here. So the only thing you can do is move the car parking. And as soon as they realized that, they knew they were in trouble because they knew what the retailers would say, oh, you can't touch the car parking. That's essential for our livelihood, even though it isn't. But they were very clever. They knew that if they did the studies and said to the retailers, we don't think you need the car parking, the retailers would say, we don't believe you. So the council gave the retail association $10,000 and said, go and do your own surveys, please, and come back and tell us who uses this street and how much they spend. And the retail association said, said fine, yeah, because we know it's going to prove it's all car users. And what they came back with was that 57% of the expenditure is walked to the center. Another 16% came on bikes and only a quarter arrived in cars. And when they realized that, the retailers started asking for parking removal, which I think is the first time ever in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere that I'm aware of. And so what they did is they started removing car parking and turned it into busking space and other people space, parkers, et cetera. Very successful. And in the end, they decided to get rid of the cars completely. And that's what it's like now. It's a full blown car free plaza and it works exceptionally well without a single car in sight. OK, I'm going to rest my case at that because we've done enough on that basis, but I really wanted to get across the point that there is no opposition to this statement that people using slow forms of transport are more valuable in local centres than people using fast transport, i.e. cars. So, what we want in those city centres is what we like to call sticky streets, not Teflon streets. We don't want people driving there and driving through. The last thing you want is a Starbucks drive through in the middle of a successful shopping street, because that just encourages people to drive through. You want places where there's opportunities to stop, smile, join in, all of those things, patios, casual seating, pop-ups, culture, evening economy, all of those things encourage more people to come in. They attract walking shoppers. And we know from other surveys that walking shoppers are much more likely to come along with other walkers. They come in larger groups, family groups, friends tend to go in groups shopping on foot. So walkers bring more walkers with them, the turbocharger effect again. And in the end, that adds to more vibrancy because what people like most of all is watching other people. So they slow down, they linger, they dwell, and they spend more money. They'll sit down for a while, chat, Go and get an ice cream, sit down for a while, go and get a coffee, sit down for a while, oh, it's evening, why don't we go for a meal, now we're here. And if they were driving through in a car, none of that would have happened. So sticky streets, not Teflon streets. So walking is about spending time, not saving time. And I put this up here to give you an indication of how this is so misunderstood. This was a serious proposal for Oxford Street in London. Um, which is very, very crowded for pedestrians. Somebody came up with the idea of dividing the footpath into two, a slow lane here next to the shops and a fast lane out here next to the cars. And those uh, behaviors would be policed by um, local monitors, marshals, and their jobs would be to make sure that everybody kept up with the required speeds in the lane that they were at. Uh, and in particular, they said, and I finish here, there was a strict ban on mobile phones, push chairs, wheelchairs, cameras, personal stereos, pets, eating, map reading, and smoking. Well, why, why would you want to go there? I mean, you can't do any of those things. But there's the perception that you've got to speed people through rather than slow them down. OK, let's summarize all of that in one slide. This is what I've been saying, really, for the last few minutes. People on foot spend more than drivers. They visit more often and spend more money and they disproportionately add to the vibrancy. And yet there's a series of myths about them purported, um, propagated by retailers in particular, um, which results in unnecessary demands for parking. And the summary is that local businesses, when you're planning your retail strips and your shopping centers, this is a key issue. Those local businesses benefit most from reducing traffic speeds, widening footpaths, making the street more attractive to people spend time and therefore 
money. And the mantra is the slower we travel, the more we spend. That's the underlying philosophy below all of this uh, debate. Okay, what is a great walking environment? Well, people talk about the five C's, um, connected, comfortable, convenient, convivial, conspicuous. I'm not gonna go through the details of this space here, but you can see how wide footpaths, shade, uh, access to buses, very little traffic, business walkers, shopping walkers, conviviality, people chatting, people sitting down, uh, accessible for this guy here with, with a rolling device. So that's a very typical, fully accessible and um, walking environment for uh, large numbers of people. And that's important because we've lost that perspective, it seems to me sometimes. Walking is not homogeneous and walkers are not homogeneous. We are all different shapes, sizes, ages, purposes, speeds, intents, and you have to plan a walking environment that meets all of those needs. And it's a particular issue in the last 10 years, becoming more and more insistent about women. It's a gender issue because nearly a, a very large percentage of planners in the world are middle-aged men with a windshield perspective who don't walk very much. And in every country in the world, women walk, walk more than men, every country. So if you're planning for walking environments, you're planning for women, and that's frequently forgotten. The safety and the security issues are top of mind or should be top of mind, and they frequently aren't. Okay, that's about being in the center. What about accessing the center? Very quickly, there are three kinds of access that I want to talk about quickly. One is accessing by car, um, and that results in barriers, car parks, danger, pollution, noise, parking, uh, forcing people to walk further and so on. Um, this is actually not talking about the parking. This is just about the environment that results from people coming in cars. And I love this here. This is an Australian suburban strip street, and they've put railings all the way down one side. And now you can't see her face very clearly, but she is sort of gazing wistfully across the street at all the other shops she will never be able to visit. Because the planners in there Benev benevolence have decided that this street is too dangerous for her to shop at. And that's important because you've chopped the street in half. So you've chopped the economic value of the street in half. You're only going to get 50% of your spend here because of the railings. So the negative impact of drive through shoppers is out of all proportion to the extra business that they bring. Okay. If you do access by uh, car, then you're going to need cheap and abundant parking. And the more you provide that, the more you encourage people to drive to the center. So you're shooting yourself in your foot by providing more parking and expecting later on to, you know, to redeem that. And uh, Daniel Herridge's in a Strong Towns uh, blog a couple of months ago said, public space in a lively urban area is a tremendously important and scarce resource and parking is just about the least valuable thing we can do with it. Any city can do this math. So the idea that parking at a curbside brings revenue is utterly false. It does exactly the opposite. It removes revenue streams from that city. And as Cynthia Nicotine put it beautifully and pithily, no one ever goes to somewhere because it's got great parking. You can't imagine that conversation, can you? Well, let's go, let's go to so-and-so town. It's got great parking. Nothing to do, but it's got great parking. Okay, that's if you access on a car. What about if you access in other ways? You can access on foot, but walkers don't just sort of materialize from behind the buildings. They've got to get there somehow. And that means you need to provide for them in terms of integrated networks. It's just the same way as you provide for integrated networks for car travel. Um, and that means it has to be connected, it has to be accessible to all, there has to be symbiotic relationships with public transport, in other words, the footpaths connect with bus stops and railway stations, and every single crossing in your pedestrian integrated network has priority over cars at intersections. That's a, a, a fundamental for your, uh, for your network. And I have to ask the question, I mean, many of you will come from towns in New Zealand or other parts of the world that have a bike network. 
and a bike strategy and a bike policy. How many of you come from places that have a pedestrian network or pedestrian policy even or pedestrian strategy? And the answer is often, no, we don't. And yet it's critically important. You can't expect people to access the center unless they have an integrated network to do so. And then thirdly, I've talked about cars, I've talked about walking, the third one would be bikes. And ideally what you want accessing the town center would be a, a, a network of protected bike lanes. It's the best thing that you can do for access. And ITDP in Washington just said about protected bike lanes, they are relatively inexpensive, can be built rapidly, but when these networks are implemented at a citywide scale, their impact is huge. So protected from traffic uh, and focusing on your town center. Okay, um, and bear in mind, mobilities are with us now, of course, micro mobilities, uh, scooters, e-bikes, uh, LEVs, light electric vehicles, all kinds of them appearing now. Um, and they, of course, make the case for more segregated bike lanes because that's probably the best place for them to travel. And I'm gonna move on quickly from that and then argue, okay, so you've got your walking network into the town center, you've got your bike network into the town center, but what about where you live? What about when you open your door in the morning, if there's just streams of traffic and you can't even get out, start your walk or start your bike ride. Do so you need calm spaces in your residential neighborhood as well? So that's what you should be looking at now. And that is your slow spaces around housing areas. And, you know, these cases, this one is in Brooklyn, I think. This one is somewhere in Utrecht. Um, they are low speed environments. And because they're low speed environments, you don't need bike tracks, you don't need bike paths, you don't need any protection. Everybody's traveling at the same speed. So you just buzz along, you don't need helmets, you don't have to put special gear on. Here you can cycle in normal clothing on your normal daily activities without special measures, provided that the speeds are low. And by low, I mean 30 kilometers an hour, absolute maximum. Get that and all the other things follow from it. Okay, how do you do that? Well, around the world now, we're seeing more and more places go for 30 kilometers an hour as the norm. And I know there are many of these appearing in Auckland and New Zealand cities, but what the best cities are doing now is not just having it as the norm, but having it as the default. Paris is now default 30. Every street in Paris, you can't drive at more than 30 kilometers an hour unless it says you can. It's the reverse of what we've grown up with, okay? It's 30, unless we tell you otherwise. And more and more cities are doing that. And if you do that around where people live, then these slow spaces become absolutely possible. It started in Graz in Austria in 92. Now look at some of these figures here from around the world, Berlin and uh, other cities having very high percentages of their populations now, North America as well, um, where people live in very quiet, residential environments. Okay, I'll skid past uh, that one here, but this is the, the kinds of results you get. And I think this is a really significant slide, even though I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't say much about New Zealand because I couldn't get the data, but I think I know what the data will, will say. This is children walking or cycling to school in seven countries across the world. The green bar is the percentage of kids who go on their own on foot and bike to school. Japan, it's nearly 100%. Um, Netherlands, it's over 90. Finland, Denmark, Germany, it's all over 50. And the significance of those places, every single one of those countries around schools has a speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour. These bottom two have speed limits around school of all kinds, but they are never less or rarely less than 40 or 50. And they are not normally default for 30 or, or a lower speed. And look at their figures for walking and cycling to school. And I haven't time to go into that, but we could have a long discussion about what that means for kids' development, about their health, about their lack of ability to walk and cycle and get incidental health benefits as part of their lives, about the damage to their parents. I'm sorry, ignore that. It's just it's telling me I'm dying, but I'm not. Um, I don't think I am. Anyway, if I fall over, I, I proved wrong again. Um, oh, shut up. Sorry. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and that, of course, means a huge amount of parental time spent chauffeuring kids around. Um, and you will have seen yourself, it also means an extension of the rush hour through another two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening because most of the traffic on the road is driving kids to school. So this is an enormously damaging phenomenon. And it's one that can be solved by grasping this nettle of reducing speeds around school as a, a de facto approach. Okay, well, New Zealand's not completely lost here. You've had your consultation last year, last year uh, the New Zealand Shaping Streets consultation, uh, which is now closed, but uh, I understand that was quite vigorous. And the four main themes there were to deal with the issue of street pilots, in other words, demonstration projects, cheap and cheerful paint, hay bales, cones, whatever, make something in a couple of hours, see if it works. And if it doesn't work, take it away. Doesn't matter, you haven't lost anything. Experiment, try, hack, tinker, and then analyze, and then design afterwards. So instead of spending 20 million to start with, spend $15 and try it for a week. And it's called tactical urbanism. Or you can call it street pilots, or you can call it demonstration projects. But they're used all over the world to reduce the anxiety that people have about change and to show people how good it can be if you were to prepare to make things a little differently. They, this document talks about restricting traffic, about modal filters, in other words, keeping traffic out of residential neighborhoods, but allowing people to walk and bike through them. They talk about school streets, which are actually start and end of school day measures. And they talk also about community streets, which might be three hour closures on a regular basis to allow kids and so on to play in those streets. So New Zealand is looking at this now, and there is a document out there that if you don't know about it, certainly follow up on that and see what the consultation responses have been like. So what you've got out there is a whole series of ideas which you can pursue if you wish. And the point is, in the end, these are choices. It's up to us which direction we choose to go. And I'm very reluctant to show too many European examples because the response is always, oh, well, that's Amsterdam. We are not Amsterdam. We can't do that. Amsterdam can do it because it's Amsterdam, but we can't because we're Amsterdam North or whatever. So if you put up a picture of Amsterdam, everybody says, yeah, yeah, we can't do that. But if you pick up, put up a picture of what Amsterdam was like 30 years ago, that's what Amsterdam was like 30 years ago. Amsterdam wasn't always like Amsterdam is now. And as Brent Tedarian, the Canadian urban planner, said recently, Amsterdam chose to give their streets to cars, and then they chose to take them back. There's nothing magical about Amsterdam. They just chose. These, in other words, are not financial choices. They're not technical choices. They are political choices. And if this is what you want, you can have that with the right culture and policy shifts. And just lastly, in terms of the benefits, before I wrap up with a couple of slides, I just want to make sure that you're aware that this isn't just about retail. There's plentiful evidence that walking centers and cycling centers bring enormous other benefits as well. And Rodriguez and Leinberger have just published this in the States. This is the second of two volumes. The first one was about 2016, I think, called Foot Traffic Ahead. Look at this, the average gross domestic product of the eight most walkable places in the United States is 36% higher than the eight least walkable. It's not just about retail. For investors, continued growth in walkable urbanism suggests that these are areas to focus on rather than the, de are the declining 20th century office parks and strip malls. So there's a massive benefit to others as well in terms of real estate and commerce and business and so on that come out of walkability in urban areas. There's an issue, a side issue here with gentrification, which we need to be aware of. But provided you can manage that strategy successfully, then walkability will bring you widespread benefits. Okay, so here's my slow city dividend. <clears throat> this is, you know, you know what a dividend is. You invest in a strategy or a bank or something for a long period. In the end, you get a, a dividend. You get something back. This is what you get back. 
It's about the local economy. It's about urban regeneration. It's about the attractiveness and marketability of the city on the international tourism stage and so on. It's about city branding. Who the hell wants to go to Los Angeles and look at, sky, look at uh, freeways? People go to you know, Italian cities and watch other people sitting and doing nothing. That's branding. Cost savings, less congestion costs, construction, maintenance cost savings. And this is the killer, individuals and families. Reduced healthcare costs because you're much fitter in a slow city because you're active all the time. Reduced costs of living car free or car light. You don't need two cars. You can go down to one or you may not have one. You go down to none. And the result is your living expenses will be much lower. And the one right at the end that's often forgotten, and that is if you buy a car, it loses money all the time. If you buy a house, it gains money all the time. A house is an investment. A car is a loss maker. So if you spend your money on getting around in the mobile city by spending it on cars, you are definitely not going to get rich. But if you spend your money instead on a house and walk in a walkable neighborhood, your house will increase, increase in value. And current estimates are that in the US, you'd be a million dollars richer at the end of 30 years of that process. So there's huge benefits here to individuals in the city and the economy at large. So how do you get this? Well, people are talking about this as a possible sort of design shortcut to that. These are the so-called 15-minute cities, um, an, an idea from Carlos Moreno in, in Paris in the last 10 years. This diagram is actually from Melbourne's plan for 20-minute cities, but it, it matters not. It's the same basic idea. Um, within your 20-minute neighborhood, Everything can be reached within a 20 minute or a 15 minute journey on foot or by bike, everything. So whether it's, you know, educational or whether it's uh, um, housing issues or whether it's green space or whether it's employment and so on, you can effectively live your life satisfactorily within a 15 minute radius of your house within your 15 minute neighborhood. Now, look what that brings you. Oops, sorry. Oh, I did go a long way ahead. Um, in terms of speed, these meet the arguments that I've been put forward, putting forward. They meet the essential daily needs of a 15-minute journey return trip by a foot, bike, or e-scooter. You don't need fast travel in a 15-minute city. Number one gain. Second gain, one perhaps you haven't thought of, in a pandemic, and remember the World Health Organization is telling us there will be more pandemics and they will be much more serious and we'd better get ready for them. And this is urban planning to protect you against pandemics because what you can do with this, if a pandemic breaks out, a virus breaks out in this neighborhood, you can isolate the whole area from the rest of the city and yet know that everybody still in this area can live a normal life or relatively normal life. So it's pandemic resistant which is probably going to be really important in the future. And then thirdly, look what it does in terms of the climate crisis, because here people are using low energy forms of transport, low emission forms of transport, and they're not sprawling. And it's sprawling, which in terms of embodied emissions, carbon emissions, is hugely damaging. I mean, if concrete were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter after China and the US. It's astonishing, isn't it? And every road you build, every car park you build, every new housing estate and bridge, it's concrete and asphalt, which are massively damaging, and they are effectively there for the next 50 years. So without sprawl, you're protecting yourself again from the climate. So what a massive group of gains these are from the slow travel that you can use. Speed, pandemics, and the climate. So what we're seeing, understandably, around the world is a gradual renaissance of slow now. The view that slow is not a sacrifice, it's an opportunity to do something different. Um, and as Fred Kent said, if you plan cities for cars and traffic, you'll get cars and traffic. But if you plan cities for people and places, you get people and places. A different way of approaching this. So the pushback has started. Here's my favorite character here. This is Pea Tonito, the uh, masked defender of pedestrians' rights in Mexico City, who goes out on the streets every day dressed like this. And when he sees a car parked on a crosswalk, he just pushes it off. Um, 
Now we don't all have to do that. We don't have to, we don't have to be that brave, but uh, he's a nice symbol of how the pushback is happening around the world. So in summary, what I've tried to do is bust a few myths for you here. Here's six of them. Car users spend more in local centers than walkers and cyclists, wrong. Retailers make good transport planners, wrong. Car parking is the most valuable use of curb space in local centers, wrong. 30 kilometer an hour zones don't work and are unpopular. Well, they're often unpopular to start with, but they're usually very popular uh, later on. You can't change the culture, wrong. And faster is always better, which is what big speed has been telling us for the last 100 years. So my last message to you is to get walking, but don't pass on slothfulness, please, to the next generation. Um, I want your kids to grow up thinking that's a normal way to get around the city. And do remember, this is the last slide, so you can wake up now. Do remember, what kind of place do you actually want to live in? This is New Zealand here. This is Auckland, actually. Do you want your kid to have to stand in the middle of this street to go to school? Is that the kind of place that you want? Or when that child grows up, do you want her to be in this kind of environment instead? So what do you need to be thinking of? Where do you want to be and how do you get there? That's the, the, the future. Where do you want to be? How do you put things in place to ensure that that comes out? And as you do that, remember always that walkers and cyclists are the indicator species for quality of life in our cities. Okay, thanks very much. And I'm sorry about the peeping, and I'm still alive. Adrian might disagree with me, um, so I'll give him the opportunity to come back after this. <clears throat> I would say the most important thing that you can do at this stage, given the amount of public pushback that is likely to happen about any change, I mean, I, the sense I get here is this is a very conservative society that doesn't actually want to change things very much. Um, new things frighten people. Um, and so what you need to be able to do is demonstrate quickly and without a great deal of expense how, how things can be better if you change them. And that takes me back to the idea of pilots and demonstration projects and tactical urbanism. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that your government is actually consulting on those. And these don't have to be local government led. They can be led by communities. They can be led by activists in their street, you know, knock on the doors, take a bottle of sherry round or whatever, and get to know everybody and then go out with some chalk and paint and do something on the street with your kids. Um, maybe you need to phone the council. I mean, I, perhaps I shouldn't be saying this publicly, but uh, you, you could do it completely independently or you could do it with the council or you could do it with other activist groups or whatever. But the important thing to do is to get together and do something. And that will do two things. It will change the space, which may survive. It may not, but you've learned something if it doesn't. Next time, do it different. Choose somewhere else, do it rather differently. But it's also started to gel you as a community to realize that you are together and are recognizing you've got a problem. Because, you know, the transport emissions reduction pathway in, in, in uh, uh, Auckland here is talking about a 64% in transport uh, redu uh, um, emissions reductions in seven years. I mean, it's a, it's a remarkably ambitious uh, uh, target and you're not gonna get there unless you do these kinds of things. Um, one of the examples I think is worth looking at is Oslo, if you can. They have completely removed car travel from the city center um, by removing car parking. 
Um, they've done some really quite remarkable things in a very short space of time. And the chief planner who was in charge of that, when asked what her main learnings were, she said, throw the rule book out. You won't get anywhere by just following the rules. You have to find another way of getting around them to present things to people which are creative and will work. Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, so I'll combine my question with the online one. Uh, so someone asked, uh, you know, a lot of cities get, uh, whether they're enforced or not, it's another issue, but they get revenue from on street parking. Uh, so how do you convince cities, municipalities, things like that to reallocate that space? Um, you know, make that argument that the revenue may not be as important as, as other uses. Um, and then my question I'll tack on to that related is, um, you talked a lot about retailers thinking a lot of their business comes from bars and drivers. Um, and I've chalked that up to kind of that, that windshield bias that retailers will often be the ones that are driving in so they can be their customer base that. So how do you convince the retailers that this is the wise investment also in their transport sector and that it's not the car that's driving in? Mm. I don't know whether you want to come in at any point. Yeah. Any I mean, well, um, Janet Sadiq Khan was giving this yeah. talk. He was saying that data, data, data. And so collecting all that before and after and taking the lead information is really important. On the parking revenue issue, what we often find is that people will be parked in the premium real estate, but then there will be excess capacity one block away, which isn't being used and isn't being charged for and you can just get people to move you know so once you reclaim that space those who still want to drive and hopefully it won't be as many will they've still got somewhere to park and you can still collect money off them so that loss of revenue is never as big as people would have you believe mm. Recruit that back into a city because I mean, Auckland doesn't necessarily have a town center in the appropriate location to achieve that with the right amenities. So, what is the process of achieving yeah. that? Our city is effectively being built in the center. Yeah, it's a smashing question. Um, and what I didn't get time in the presentation to dwell on was that the, some of these solutions are over different time spans. And the, you know, the sort of 30 kilometer an hour is instant and it has a massive impact. Whereas 15 minute cities, that's a longer term strategy. It's not necessarily long term. You can identify, you know, we all know within, I don't know, within Auckland, there's got to be village centers where you can see there, you know, there are neighborhoods around which you can actually put some kind of boundary and say, well, yeah, generally speaking, if we fill in a little bit in terms of medical facilities or a little bit here with something else, we can make this into almost a self-contained neighbourhood. Uh, the spread space of Auckland is that we actually have a lot of very distinct local centres where there is a good range of jobs and services and employment opportunities. So I think it's kind of right for the picking or a kind of 15, 20 minute city approach. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it's just a kind of uh, getting people to really that <laughs> is as much of a battle as anything. Mm. Well, we can also just use like the integration network and then you can just connect them, those town centers with one another, or can have a very like it all connects into the CBD, but there's not necessarily a network connecting them east to west or through that kind of side link. Yeah, that's correct. And, and I think. If, if you think about how a lot of people, if you're a driver, your perception of the city is probably a linear motorway that runs north to south, and you kind of go off to certain places, and that's your mental map of the city. Whereas people who are walking and cycling tend to have a much richer mental map, and they know where all the other mm. opportunities are that you know that aren't kind of car oriented, mm. and and I think. That is one of the challenges that we have. And, and certainly our, we, we had a guy from America at one of the talks I was giving, and she was saying, you don't really have a public transport network in Auckland. You've got a commuter network. 
mm -hmm. because you can't get from those district centre to district centre so easily. You can get in and out of the CBD quite easily. I think that's a really valid point. But mm -hmm. yeah, so those east west connections don't necessarily work very well if you're not driving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just for a moment, coming in London with uh, going from suburb to suburb is equally difficult by public transport because again, it's quite a radial network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just going back to your earlier question about um, convincing retailers, um, you can use a bit of subterfuge, which I've tried on, on occasions, and that is challenge them on where they and their staff actually park their cars. Um, and they all start to shuffle around and look a bit guilty. Um, and I've got slide sets from lots of towns where I've gone out there at quarter past seven in the morning in the dark, and the shopkeepers are in the shop getting ready for the day and the car parks along the street are full and it's all them there's no shoppers there because the shops don't open for two more hours and yet they would say that it's absolutely essential for the life of my business that that space outside my shop is empty all day um, but again then you use the data on top of that to show that um, the turnover and so on need, needs to be um of a certain kind and certain speed in order to generate the sort of income that they're, they're getting and, and we you know the, the local case study in Auckland we've been having like, that with that conversation with the Graders Business Association who want to put a scheme in along Great North Road they worried about parking we went and talked to individual businesses and and everybody said well it's not our customers that has the problem parking it's our staff because they've got to move their cars every two hours during the day because of the parking restriction but we can work with that because then we can kind of you know work with permit systems we can work with well where can they park elsewhere within you know within 200 meters of the corridor there are over a thousand car parking spaces so there is no lack of space but it's just the perception that yeah, well, if we want to park outside the door of where they are working, then yeah, they're going to have to move their car every two hours because it, the idea with that car parking is it's for retail time. And what's the cost in terms of lost productivity there of your staff roaming around the streets trying to find somewhere to park their car? Mm. So, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I liked the production screen thing, and particularly the idea about making it to the poll, like they're getting to the poll everywhere. But how does that work when many of the streets are being signed for much faster travel and people are still just without like massive volume? Mm. We're still going to drive 60 plus k's on what were 50k roads that you went on. Mm. I think where it's been rolled out most successfully is where the default actually doesn't mean every street. What it means is every residential street and every neighborhood street, you know, and you'll need a definition of that to convince people that you're choosing the right ones. Generally speaking, the arterials would be accepted and they might remain at 40 or even 50 in some cases. Um, so that's a recognition that longer distant movement from parts of the city to other parts or even through the city is still necessary and supported. But it's not necessary to have those streets away from the arterials. Um, the great advantage of default is that you don't need lots of signs. You, you don't confuse drivers by thinking, well, is this 30 or isn't this 30? What am I supposed to be doing? They all know it's all 30. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's beneficial in, in all sorts of ways. It changes the culture. It changes the assumptions about what you should be doing in these kinds of places. And you might be able to make, you know, with Adrian's department's help, minor tweaks to the look of the road, the feel of the road, to so that the road tells the story. So that when you drive in, you think, ooh, this is different from what I've been on, and I'm expected to behave differently. And there's a very substantial literature on psychological traffic calming and how you can do that to give those signals cheaply, quickly, and very effectively, too. I mean, the, the Dutch have this concept of self-explaining roads where different categories and typologies of roads will it, it will be instinctive because of the layout of the road what the speeds the proper speed limit will be and most of the rest of the world don't have that because they kind of the roads have grown up over 100 years and they're a, a mix 
and what you can do is introduce elements so you know the little gateway features that narrow down the relevant point at which the um speed limit changes um things like um you be on um in order European towns there'll be a uh, small town there'll be a roundabout at either end of the town which just breaks up the flow of traffic before they hit the high street and then that makes that high street into a 30 kilometer environment even though it might be carrying quite a lot through traffic so mm -hmm. it's just little tricks and things that you can do to help reinforce the speed and even you know it, it, in a city like Auckland where the roads are not necessarily instructively linked to the top of the speed limit. 